All right. Um, good morning. Welcome to our panel on, um, on artificial intelligence, data, and cybersecurity. Um, you know, as, as we know, technology has become you know, ubiquitous in every aspect of everyday life, and that includes investment management. Um, asset managers use technology for trading, uh, risk management, operations, client services. And along with the growth of technology, you know, terms, these terms, artificial intelligence, data, cybersecurity, they just become kind of common terms in our everyday lives. And so, you know, we thought we'd assemble um, some experts to discuss how these terms, how these concepts are used by investment management, investment managers, and, uh, you know, the different issues that arise from their use. Um, my name is Eric Simonek. I'm a partner in the Capital Markets and Investment Group at Eversheds, and uh, my practice focuses on kind of development and regulation of open-end funds. And so I'll just let everybody introduce themselves. Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rachel Reed. I'm a partner with Evershed Sutherland in the Atlanta office. I lead the firm's artificial intelligence practice in the US, um, and my practice also involves data privacy, cybersecurity, technology, um, and commercial contracts generally. I'm Neil Higgins. I'm a litigation partner here in the Washington office. I am co-lead of our congressional investigations practice, uh, but also focus on cybersecurity, data privacy, and national security issues. Wow, how did I end up with uh, four lawyers? <laughs> That's the first one for me. I'm generally hanging with CFOs and stuff. Uh, Cesar Estrada, uh, I'm responsible for the private markets uh, business at Arcesium. Um, I spent the last uh, 20 years in, in, in private markets uh, um, talking uh, to, to firms uh, like uh, yours. And um, um, our CCM is a, uh, an investment uh, operations and data management uh, technology solutions firm. And uh, managed uh, services are, uh, we launched in 2015, uh, anchored by uh, Blackstone, uh, JP Morgan, and D. Shaw, and uh, have added uh, numerous clients uh, since, including a growing number of uh, private uh, credit firms. Good to be here today. Thanks, Cesar. Uh, hi, my name is Dwayne Dupree. I'm a partner in the Capital Markets Group here at Evershed Sutherland. Uh, in this context, obviously, I represent BDCs and other alternative investment uh, platforms, but in this context, also uh, deal with corporate governance and board governance, particularly related to AI and other issues. All right. So, uh, Caesar, well, if we could start with you. Um, before we kind of dive into artificial intelligence and generative AI, um, you know, data is a primary building block for generative AI. So would you be able to discuss some of the trends in the use of data in private markets? Sure, sure. So uh, the, the, the headline is uh, uh, data is growing at a exceedingly faster pace than, than your AUM um, and um, growing in, in volume, but also in, in complexity. Um, a number of things um, all lining up, a number of stars at the same time having that happen, um, some of which have been discussed uh, here yesterday. You have many more active products at the same time across uh, different product wrappers with different economic terms, across different distribution channels, uh, and that all compounds uh, uh, the, the, the data challenge and the data opportunity for, for, for your firms. Furthermore, your client base, your investor base uh, overlaps uh, across all of those different uh, investment products uh, and funds, and then therefore their asks of you become uh, more complex. And not only them, but uh, equally your internal stakeholders and regulators are all very data hungry and uh, asking more of you. So uh, there is also as a clear trend uh, from my lens at least, uh, that uh, there's a growing recognition uh, that, uh, that um, um, there is a need as you seek to double yet again your AOM over the next uh, few years uh, to have a modern infrastructure to deal with uh, data and uh, be, be, um, leave you better able to scale your analytical and reporting needs. And also, um, it's clearly a foundational element for uh, a, an AI initiative. So Rachel, with that background on sort of data as a building block, can you explain what generative, generative AI is um, as a concept? And then what's the difference between generative AI, which seems like it's relatively novel, and then AI, which people have been using for years? 
Absolutely. And one of the first things I do when I'm talking to clients about artificial intelligence and particularly about governance and responsible AI use is to level set on the definitions we're using those terms um, because a lot of folks are still using them in significantly different ways. So at risk of everyone getting up and walking out of the room, I'm going to put up a couple mm -hmm. of slides, um, some of which are technical. Um, but so artificial intelligence is very broadly defined, both under the Biden, um, the executive order that came out from the Biden White House in October of last year, and the NIST AI risk management framework. These are sort of the two definitions we look to to level set on what is artificial intelligence. And they're extraordinarily broad, such that they literally capture technology that's been around since the 1970s, right? Um, the important thing to note, though, is that what we're seeing from all of the regulators at both the federal and state level is that they're using this broad definition in their regulations. So even though generative AI, right, which hit everybody with a boom when ChatGPT was released just last year or the end of 22, um, that's what's getting everybody's attention. When regulators are now acting on that, they're cascading their regulations with a very wide net such that encompasses any type of engineered or machine-based system. So we're talking um, algorithms, predictive models, right? Things that many of your firms may have been using for data analytics and other things for a very long time. So as you're putting your governance and compliance programs in place, it's important to understand, right, that broadly um, all artificial intelligence technology is what's being regulated. Now, generative AI, as you can see from kind of the circle map, is a subset of that. And there are just a couple of unique characteristics that distinguish generative AI from traditional AI, and then there are a number of unique risks that come along with that. So first is that the volume of data being processed by generative AI technology and the processing power the compute power of generative AI is exponentially greater than traditional artificial intelligence. So you could actually write or probably pronounce <laughs> the, the amount of computing power that we use with older artificial intelligence. With Gen AI, it's like some ginormous number to the 26th power or something of that nature. So think massively exponentially larger. The other distinction, which is a really critical one when we're thinking about it, is that Unlike traditional artificial intelligence, generative AI has the capability to, to create new synthetic content or data, right? So traditional algorithms, predictive models would analyze data, they could sort it, they could splice it and dice it, combine it, segment it, but they couldn't come up with a brand new data element that was distinct and different, right, from the underlying data set. Generative AI can. But that's what leads to some of the unique risks with generative AI, such as hallucinations, which I'm sure we've all heard of, right? It's gonna make something up based on the data set that may not exist in the real world, or it may not be accurate. The other risks we see with these models, again, because of the vast amounts of data, are risks like bias and discrimination um, against different groups or parties or just sort of a, a separation or a dissociation between the data set and the output. And let me just take a minute to explain that further. So think of our traditional kind of the, the most common generative AI models like ChatGPT, right? That's the one we've all heard of. Large, these large language models were literally created by scraping all of the data it could get its mechanical hands on across the World Wide Web, as well as you know, ingesting any other data sets that the creators could put into those models. So if you think about all of the data on the web, right, is that data accurate? These are rhetorical questions, of course. Is it unbiased? Is it fit for purpose? And if so, what purpose? Right, if you wanna, use Gen AI for some of the things Cesar mentioned, right? To look at your assets under management or to crunch numbers is really a model that was trained on all of the data available on the web, right? The right data set 
to give you the results you want. So I think that's why it's important to really understand what these models are and how they were built. So when you're looking at adopting solutions in your business, you can make the right choices. This is just a high level, again, how generative AI works. So there's a bunch of training data. And for the large language models for what was used in ChatGPT and Microsoft Copilot, it's literally all of the data that they could dump into the system was used to train it. There are models, right, you'll see with companies that are more targeted that are trained on specific sets of data, um, such as stock market data, right, SEC filings. So you can get a model that's trained more um, specifically on certain data, but on my next slide, I'm gonna explain how to assess really if, if what's being marketed to you or what you're looking at adopting is fit for purpose and has been done that way. So all of that goes into the model in the middle, it's trained, and then it spits out basically a response to whatever type of query or input you put into the system. And we call that the output. So it could be the answer to a question. It could be text. It could be images. It could be um, following instructions, right? Any number of things. So we have, we have training data. We need to understand what that is. Then we have inputs to the model, what the user who's interacting it with it asks it to do. And then output is the results. And that's what we want, right? We want quality results that we can use to further our business purposes. And then this is the one where people like to get up and leave because it's super technical, but I think it's very important to understand the technology stack for an AI foundational model or large language model. So again, we're talking about ChatGPT, Microsoft Copilot, Dolly, these giant models um, that these powerful tech companies have built. They run on these multi-layer stacks. And starting at the bottom, that's literally just your data center, your cloud infrastructure. So that's the same as most technology runs on today. On top of that is the acceleration software. And again, because of the massive, massive processing power that's needed to run these models, you need that extra layer or they wouldn't perform quickly enough to meet our needs. In the middle of the stack is the model. And I think it's important to understand there are only a dozen, maybe 13, 14 large language models in existence in the world today. So when you are talking to a vendor about their AI solution and they're using a large language model, they should be able to tell you which one. And if it is one of these sort of publicly available large language models like GPT-3, GPT-4, you know then that it was trained on this massive sort of unfiltered data set. And so you can be aware of what the consequences of that might be. Now the way companies sort of filter or put guardrails around that is with that second to the top layer, the API services. So that's where if you've adopted, for example, Microsoft Copilot, they have this like abuse monitoring filters and they put things in place to prevent sort of um, offensive content or to try to restrict hallucinations and to try to protect against output that could infringe intellectual property rights. All of that is done at the API layer, right? So the model is the model. It's still GPT-4 is what Microsoft uses for Copilot, but they've put this layer on top of it to try to contain it on some level. And so that's when, when you're implementing these frameworks in your environment, you really need to be talking you know, to your IT people about all the layers of the stack to make sure it's configured properly. And then at the top is the application, it's the user interface. So just using a really simple example, um, like Workday. So HR software, most of us use some kind of HRIS system to manage our employee bases. They've come out and said, we now have Workday as an AI you know, solution, the next version. But all they're doing is building an integration down the stack into an existing large language model. They haven't built their own. So when vendors come in and I say, you know, even if companies say, oh, we're not ready to adopt Gen AI, we're, we're gonna you know, tread carefully in this space, if you use commercially available third-party software, particularly if they're SaaS or hosted solutions, that next version is gonna be AI enabled or AI enhanced, right? So as we think about it in SESIT, you really need to understand what that means as far as what technology um, are you actually connecting to? And then back to Cesar, is my company's data actually going down into one of these large language models or is it still secure in my network? 
Um, and Neil's going to talk more about the security aspects of that a bit later. There's going to be a quiz on this later. About <laughs> All right, I think only one person left, so thank you for bearing with me. Yeah. All right, thank you. So if we could turn to Neil. You know, we've noticed that companies in the private credit business are using AI for um, risk assessment, due diligence, and portfolio management. Um, so how does this compare to other companies, and um, do you think there are unique risks to this use for this use of data? So I think maybe we can start by zooming out and looking at how enterprises at large are using AI, um, which is largely how companies in the private credit space are as well. Um, the first application of AI is with generative AI, very much what Rachel discussed, and that's using tools like Copilot almost as starter for the sourdough, right? Giving you the first draft that you then iterate on. Um, if any of you have worked with Copilot, it is fantastic for that purpose, right? If you know a little bit about the topic and you can fashion the correct prompt for the AI tool, it will give you great text um, for marketing, for uh, a memo, it can even capture the transcript of a meeting and write up minutes for you. But it's not perfect, it requires human review and editing. Uh, but that is sort of the initial um, purpose to which enterprises across the spectrum are using generative AI. The second application of AI, uh, again, writ large, but specifically in the private credit space, is for analyzing, well, ingesting, analyzing, and deterring patents and anomalies in larger amounts of data at a faster speed than humans could ever achieve, right? Um, and faster than humans directing computers could achieve, right? So letting the computer, um, if you will, burn off the hay so that the humans can then focus on the needles, and even letting the computer identify more needles in the haystack in the process. Um, as you noted, there are um, really kind of three uh, key areas where that's happening in the private credit space, and let me give a few kind of examples under each. Um, the first is risk assessment. Um, and here, we're talking about using AI for data aggregation and analysis, allowing the machines to sort through vastly larger sums of data than would be humanly possible um, to identify patterns and anomalies that could indicate potential risks. Um, building on that, the next application is predictive analytics. So once you have that data aggregation analysis and the machine has sorted through it and identified those patterns and anomalies, um, then predicting the likelihood and the impact of various risks based on historical trends and given the data at hand, again, um, faster with more data and higher accuracy than a human could achieve. Um, third is automated audits, right? So instead of just sampling a data set and auditing across the sample, you can audit across the entire data set. Um, and the machine, you know, sort of with, with the right data and with a well-trained algorithm is capable of doing that. Um, and then last but certainly not least in this space, in the risk assessment space, is real-time monitoring, um, which is continuously monitoring transactions and other activities um, to identify in real-time um, suspicious behaviors or potential risk, right? It's sitting atop that data flow um, and identifying those patterns um, faster and with a higher accuracy level than a human could. Um, the second major application, uh, as you identified, Eric, is, is due diligence. Um, and there, again, the key is allowing the AI systems to ingest, process, analyze um, vast amounts of data. Um, that starts with automated document review, um, but again, often as a sort of first iteration before human intervention. Um, identifying key information and potential risks in vast quantities uh, of information of documents. The second is um, risk identification. Again, this goes with risk assessment, in, but in this case, in the due diligence context, identifying patterns and anomalies in the data um, that warrant further investigation. Uh, and then the third is leveraging AI's natural language processing capabilities, the ability of these AI tools um, to actually read documents, and in this case, for example, um, identify areas where there's compliance risk based on uh, the machine's reading of the documents, right? Um, and all of that is often going to be um, as an aid, as a first cut, um, pointing analysts to where uh, further attention is required. 
Then um, last but not least, there's portfolio management. Um, and a few points I'd highlight here. The first is optimization of the construction of a portfolio. Um, identifying the best mix of assets to maximize return based on current conditions, um, including uh, asset correlation, investor sentiment, and market conditions at large. Second is real-time monitoring. Um, in this case, not for risk purposes, but for portfolio performance and market conditions, um, providing real-time alerts and recommendations on how to rebalance a portfolio. And last but not least is sentiment analysis. Again, leveraging natural language processing capabilities, the ability to go in and read um, media, social media, um, anything else that provides some sentiment analysis on which direction the market is going. Um, so those are all sort of um, ways that we're seeing AI being applied in the private credit space. In terms of the risks, frankly, they're the same uh, as for broader application of AI. Um, the first uh, the first few risks Rachel identified, hallucination, bias and discrimination, the types of risks you read about. Um, one of the challenges with uh, particularly generative AI is it's very hard to explain how the algorithms work, right? So there is an explainability issue. Um, the proxies in some ways for explainability are accuracy and reliability. So you've got to have confidence that the AI model that you're using, particularly for generative AI, but for machine learning, too, is providing both accurate and reliable results. Um, the machine obviously is only going to be as good as both the algorithm and the data to which it has access. It will be, its understanding will be bound by the data that it's able to review. Uh, and if that's not a large language model, if that's sort of the data sets that you make available, again, it'll be bound by those data sets. Um, there's another set of risks, cybersecurity risks, which we'll touch on a bit later, so I'll skip over that now. Um, but the final topic I'd identify, and this is sort of a presentation of its own, um, is if you're using generative AI, there's real intellectual property risk, both the risk that you are ingesting legally protected material and your ability to protect the output of a generative AI system. So if you're going to be using generative AI um, for anything that you want to protect uh, and you want to make sure that you're not accidentally infringing on anybody else's IP protections, um, you know, it's worth understanding and having in place necessary guardrails. So, I'll, oh, go ahead. So I'll, I'll, I'll add uh, to, uh, to Rachel and, 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 and Neil, building on what they said and offer some of the things that we're working on at, uh, at our CCM. Um, just to put it into context, one of our two um, solutions is a data platform uh, uh, application for private credit firms to bring together all of their data on their borrowers, on their loans, on their funds, on their investors, and uh, have a unified data set to conduct uh, reporting and analytics. So in that context, um, we, we, we have a, a, a Gen AI effort. Um, we also have a managed uh, services uh, organization of about a thousand people, and they, they have been using it for the last few months. We're releasing it uh, into the wild uh, to clients uh, this month. Uh, for, for certain uh, purposes, uh, so I wanted to share some of those. So uh, things like, um, we, we, we call her Florence, uh, <laughs> and uh, yes, it does leverage a large language uh, uh, um, a model out there. Uh, it connects to our knowledge base, so uh, uh, it knows uh, the tables in the databases, it knows uh, the data catalog and the semantic meaning of things. And that's how it uh, uh, conducts uh, its, uh, its work. When you ask her something, uh, so we, we're automating queries uh, for starters, right? So you, you say, well, give me my top 10 positions, and Florence will go and fetch the data, and she'll understand. Uh, give me uh, the, the loans that are uh, uh, paying pick over the last uh, period of time. Give me this, give me that, and it'll go and fetch the data. So, so that's one specific uh, use case that uh, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, releasing this, this month. Um, a second one is uh, data extraction. You, you spoke a little bit about that. Uh, more specifically, what, uh, what we're doing is, uh, uh, so uh, um, uh, Florence takes in uh, uh, images, uh, PDFs, uh, emails, and uh, on, uh, on uh, borrower financials, on uh, agent notices, on... Uh, uh, invoices on any number of things and uh, will extract uh, the data and then uh, 
put it in the right uh, tables in, 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 in the data model for uh, further use. Um, some of the things that we're working on uh, in the mid to n uh, near term is um, uh, use cases like, uh, uh, so now uh, she's doing queries, so now doing report writing and, uh, and dashboards. Hey, uh, create um, a, a graph with a time series, uh, with uh, these filters, with these data fields, with this uh, referential data on strategies, on ratings, on uh, uh, this and that, and, uh, and, and do it for me, right? Uh, that's a little bit more involved. We're, we're a few months uh, away from, from something like that. Uh, we have um, also um, uh, a thousand techies in, 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 in our team, um, and uh, it'll start helping the, the group uh, with uh, certain aspects of coding, uh, certain aspects of uh, writing the documentation on, on the code, and even uh, a first level of, uh, of review of the code. So uh, a, a bunch of exciting things uh, happening there for sure. Thank you, Cesar. And with, with all those exciting things happen, happening, um, I think Rachel mentioned that this hasn't gone without regulatory notice, in particular the SEC. Um, so Eric, if you could tell us a little bit about um, what the SEC has said about uh, generative AI and any guidance they put out or rules that they proposed recently. Yeah, they've, uh, <clears throat> you know, they have been thinking about the topic, but we, we have several kind of proposed rules that either directly or indirectly uh, address the risks of using artificial intelligence, um, but no, no rules adopted yet. I mean, the most, the, the rule that most directly addresses the, the risks of artificial intelligence was a uh, July 23, July 2023 proposal called Conflicts of Interest and uh, predictive data analysis. And um, this rule is designed to lead firms to detect and minimize conflicts of interest um, in the use of so-called covered technology. And um, without getting into sort of the full definition of covered technology, it, it covers, you know, our, includes artificial intelligence and it's, it's clear from the proposing release that this rule is kind of targeted at the use of, um, of artificial intelligence by investment managers. And, you know, it's, the proposal generally applies to firms' use of you know, so-called covered technology to the, to the extent that it is used in connection with, with the firm's engagement or communication with investors, um, including by exercising discretion with respect to um, you know, investment decisions. And, and really what the SEC is concerned about is the use of artificial intelligence um, sort of in a way that places the firm's interests ahead of investors' interests. And, and the proposing release gives a couple of examples of these types of conflicts of interest that could arise in the use of artificial intelligence. Um, you know, specifically if sort of the, the methodology for the artificial intelligence, um, you know, takes into account sort of the profitability or revenues to the firm, or, um, you know, it, its methodology incentivizes increased trading or opening, um, opening margin accounts in a way that, um, you know, benefits the firm. Um, you know, to the, to the detriment of investors. And so, you know, what the rule requires then is, is um, you know, written policies and procedures to identify and mitigate these conflicts of interest. And specifically, um, you know, policies have to be specifically tailored um, for the, you know, how, how a company uses the covered technology and how they interact with investors, you know, using the covered technology. I mean, a couple other proposed rules that more sort of indirectly address um, the use of artificial intelligence is the uh, 2022 proposal relating to investment advisor oversight of outsource of third-party service providers. Um, you know, that rule requires due diligence prior to engaging service providers for certain covered services. And, you know, the, the proposing release specifically identifies, um, you know, the company's use of artificial intelligence as an area for oversight and kind of periodic reassessment of the appropriateness of their use of artificial intelligence. So, so it specifically identifies artificial intelligence as an area that investment advisors have to exercise um, you know, oversight over, over their third-party service providers. And then as, as Neil mentioned earlier, we'll discuss a little more detail I think later on, the proposed um, uh, rule relating to investment advisor cybersecurity risks. And there, you know, as he mentioned, you know, artificial intelligence does lead to um, you know, certain increased cybersecurity risks, and so in sort of overseeing and mitigating those risks, it's kind of an indirect, um, you know, indirect 
way of requiring more diligence and oversight of their use of artificial intelligence. So, um, you know, so those are some proposals. Um, you know, we'll see what happens. I know that we've expected a final rule for a long time with respect to investment advisor cybersecurity risk, but it's, it hasn't come. So I guess we'll, we'll see what, um, you know, how these kind of rules, rules develop. Um, you know, another area of SEC focus with respect to artificial intelligence is disclosure relating to the use of artificial intelligence. So, Dwayne, do you want to talk a little bit about what the SEC said about disclosure? Yeah, I'll just quickly mention, because it looks like we're running short on time, um, I'll quickly mention AI washing, um, which uh, Chairman Gensler had a quote, and this is a quote, just don't do it. Um, I think that that's a little bit, um, I think that's a little bit high level, um, because what companies are facing, they want to let people know that they're implementing AI and they, they have um, using the most um, up-to-date technology. Um, but as Rachel mentioned, there's also this definitional thing about AI. So when you say AI and you're using AI, in particular generative AI, what does that mean? I think there's a public perception of what that means and there's the actuality of what you might be doing in your business. So everybody who's using Excel is using AI, but are you using generative AI in the way that uh, an investor would expect you to use? So I think a part of it is a definitional issue defining what you mean when you're using AI. Um, I think then it's like, what are your actual uses of AI? Is it an important component of your business? So I think the same considerations that go um, hand in hand with greenwashing um, is, are the same ones you would take into account when you're doing AI washing. Um, but just wanted to mention that, that that is a focus for the SEC and there have been um, a lot of comments on that and I suspect that they will be going uh, for people the same way that they're going against greenwashing. I can just add quickly that just because a lot of these new regs are still in the lawmaking process and haven't been enacted, that does not mean that there are not requirements out there, laws you have to comply with and enforcement that's happening. So all of the federal agencies are using existing laws on their books to enforce violations occurring through AI, so things like the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Right? They've made clear that that does not excuse a lender from its disclosure and transparency obligations just because you use an artificial intelligence system that, to Neil's earlier point, may not be fully explainable. Um, and those are actively, actively being enforced, the Fair Lending Act, the Fair Housing Act, violations occurring through um, automated systems that display housing ads based on browsing history and zip code and factors like that. And also the FTC Act um, is being used very actively to enforce unfair or deceptive trade practices um, through the use of artificial intelligence technology. All right, thank you. So what are some ethical considerations um, <clears throat> you know, that people should keep in mind from using you know, artificial intelligence in private markets? Is that my question? We could turn to uh, a Caesar or Rachel. Yes. Um, I can start. I mean, and I think one of them, I was going to use this example later, is just, again, remember that it is still just a machine. It is fallible. Um, and particularly with Gen AI, right, we know that it has a tendency for bias, discrimination, inaccuracies. Um, so just one quick example, and I always forget the um, pharmacy chain. I think it was Rite Aid, mm -hmm. um, but was using this and, and almost all modern facial recognition technology is artificial intelligence that runs it. They were using these facial recognition systems in their stores to identify past shoplifters, right? But what would happen is that the machine would ping or trigger on someone and they would immediately have store security come and remove that person from the store, right? And at least 50% of the time it was wrong. Um, you know, and we know that facial recognition in particular tends to be biased, right? It does a, it, identifies white males with a higher accuracy rate than any other right, gender, race, ethnicity. We know this, yet they were simply relying on the system. And the consequences were huge. They were fine. They were banned from using that technology for five years, things of that nature. So human oversight, I think, with every system, you, know, you have to think about what could go wrong if the system doesn't behave as intended. And then how can I, as a human being, oversee that to ensure um, that we're using AI responsibly and ethically? F fully, <clears throat> fully agree with Rachel. I don't uh, have uh, much more to add to that point. OK. Um, so I want to circle back to uh, data. Um, 
so Caesar, with a growing emphasis on sort of data-driven um, decision making in the private markets, what are some key takeaways from implementing this? Yeah, yeah, we 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 have been implementing uh, data management uh, and data governance uh, solutions through our data platform for much uh, longer than Gen AI initiatives. Uh, they build on top of those, but. Uh, uh, at the at the more foundational level, uh, there is a desire from our, our clients, uh, firms like yours, to bring data together and create that so-called single source of truth uh, to uh, be able to scale uh, your 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 business and as it relates to your analytical and reporting uh, and uh, 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 abilities. Um, if um, and, and, and the, the data platform, that unified uh, set uh, can be used for any number of things. If I look at the usage from our clients and bucket it in categories, uh, the main uh, use cases would fall under everything about performance track record and performance analysis uh, at uh, the investment, at the fund, at the investor level would be one big category used in multiple uh, uh, ways by different clients differently. A second one would be everything about uh, the, the investor and being able to better self-service and answer quicker, accurately uh, investor inquiries, ad hoc investor inquiries coming uh, at you from, 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 from different angles and giving a self-service tool for those touching your, your clients, investor relations and others, uh, a way to do that without having to uh, um, uh, rally uh, finance and others to cut and paste uh, everything into a cohesive response. Um, and, and I guess a third category, um, uh, particularly uh, for, for finance and operations to, um, uh, as the book of business grows, uh, more active funds, uh, the oversight of all of those funds, generally across a growing number of um, administrators and other uh, agents uh, becomes uh, uh, tougher. Uh, and uh, having a single place of normalized data to run time series analytics offers a way to start moving towards a more risk-based exception approach uh, to to oversight and be able to to, to scale the fourth uh, bucket would be everything else because uh, there's no limitation as to how data is uh, used uh, by by our clients uh, they they decide how to to use the data platform um, and, and and i guess uh, the the main challenge uh, as obvious as it might seem is uh, that fragmentation of, uh, of, of that data most of your firms have um, outgrown uh, Excel as a D tool for, for, for every problem uh, still very widely used but uh, um, functional systems have uh, been adopted across uh, CRMs and uh, portfolio monitoring tools and accounting systems and OMSs at times if you have a tradable book and uh, an ecosystem of uh, vendors and custodians and trustees and fund admins. And that means uh, the data is uh, trapped in silos. And, uh, and that is, uh, that is uh, the challenge, bringing that together, reconciling it, uh, validating it, and creating a harmonized uh, data set to, to perform those activities. All right, so kind of moving to our third topic and focusing more specifically on cybersecurity. Um, Neil, with you know, increased use of artificial intelligence and other technologies that have access to client information and other sensitive data, you know, robust cybersecurity defenses become more important. So, you know, can you walk us through some of the sort of major cybersecurity threats that fund managers should yeah. be aware of? So, recognizing uh, the time we have left, I'll, I'll boil it down very quickly to, to sort of three categories of risk. The first is, and I'm putting nation state risk aside, if you're targeted by a nation state cyber actor, you've got a bigger problem. The first category of risk is business email compromise, right? This is where a malicious actor gains access to your networks, usually by spear phishing one of your employees, um, and is able to send emails that appear to come from an employee to another employee, um, directing usually a wire transfer, an irreversible wire transfer. Um, that tactic is now also deploying AI technology um, using deep fake audio and video to make, uh, to make the ploy even more convincing, right? Um, and this is hitting manufacturers, it's hitting uh, financial services sector um, clients, right? People are, are facing this and a increasing number and percentage of companies are facing deep fake fueled um, business email compromise attacks. 
Um, one of the higher profile ones recently was Ferrari, the Italian auto manufacturer, where the CFO received a WhatsApp message and then an audio call that appeared to be coming from the CEO. Um, he foiled it by asking him, hey, what was the title of that book you asked me about last week, right? And the person immediately hung up. You know, he'd been suspicious already. The second type of attack is straightforward ransomware, right? Where an attacker, um, somebody in your enterprise clicks on a bad link, gives the attacker ransomware, which is a much more common route than them finding a vulnerability in your software. They get into your network, they encrypt all of your data, they may try and exfiltrate your data, um, and then have multiple levels of extortion, either pay us off in Bitcoin or we'll you know, leave your data encrypted and your systems crashed. Even if you have a backup and you say get lost, we'll restore from backup, they say we'll pay us or we'll start releasing your data, your proprietary data on the dark web. Um, or they say, okay, you can now pay us a protection fee going forward, right? So that's the other classic, um, classic risk that remains at the forefront. Last category of risk I'd identify is risks unique to using generative AI systems. Um, so before you deploy generative AI systems, people need to understand the risk that those can create for your data and for your networks. Um, so if you're using a system that attaches to a public LLM, it's not like just putting a, a prompt in a search engine. What you put in the prompt can then teach um, the algorithm, teach the model. Um, and that information that you put in the problem may be discoverable um, to other users of that model, right? So you need to understand, are you using a private model or a public model? Um, how is your data being protected if you're putting it into that AI model? Um, and what other vulnerabilities could that AI model create, both internally in terms of employees' ability to access data that they otherwise might not, uh, and in terms of external access to your systems? Let me... Let me pause there. Neil, uh, so we got three minutes left. Uh, we can't leave people afraid <laughs> with all the threats. So can you tell us what, uh, what, what are some of the best practices that you've seen in terms of you know, uh, protecting this sensitive financial data from yeah, cyber no, security? Cesar a chance to answer this as well, but fundamentally, it's the basics. It's hard passwords, patching and updating your software, phishing tests, um, you know, it is all of those um, basics that cybersecurity professionals often tell you to do. Um, it is getting those basics right, and it is literally password management, multi-factor authentication, network segmentation, software patching and updating, and inculcating a culture of security across the enterprise, right? Those are the most important steps to protect your data, making it harder for the attackers to get in, even if they steal a password, requiring multi-factor authentication, uh, even if they get in, having your network properly segmented so that they can't move laterally through your network. Uh, from from uh, the perspective of a technology uh, uh, provider, uh, the, I'll uh, add to, to, to all of those uh, just a, a few more, uh, having a, um, a, a chief a security officer and a team of um, um, security-minded professionals who are conducting regular uh, testing of the controls and uh, attending to security alerts is, is critical. The sustained investment in, in security is something uh, uh, critically important. The training uh, of uh, the employee base uh, on a regular basis uh, and uh, uh, enhancing it as uh, new tricks uh, uh, become uh, uh, known and new uh, uh, scams. Um, and um, uh, multiple layers of controls, um, uh, in our case, at uh, the infrastructure level, at the application level, at the access level, uh, creating a multi-layer, uh, more robust uh, security. I'll just add, too, that humans are still the weakest link. So training, I think every single person who has access to technology systems should be trained on these risks. And then don't be, have processes. So the number of companies that have fallen for these sort of fake wire transfer schemes when all they had to do was have a process that said, okay, if you, the CEO right, reaches out to you and says send a wire, our process is simply that you call back to a known phone number or you, or you have a second approver, right? There are a lot of these sort of basic low-tech solutions that can prevent some of these things as well. I mean, we're just about running out of time. I guess we'll ask if anybody has a question. Just in the small amount of time we have left. Um, I mean, Neil, anything you want to mention about what the SEC's 
said about cybersecurity? Yeah, so you alluded, Eric, earlier to a pending SEC rule on cybersecurity risk management for investment advisors, registered investment companies, and business development companies. That proposed rule's been outstanding for about two years, but it would put in place much of what we just discussed or require companies to put in place much of what we discussed. Um, risk assessment policies and procedures, um, user security and access policies, information protection, oversight of service providers, um, threat and vulnerability management, um, having incident response plans in the event that you do have a uh, cyber incident, and then board oversight and record keeping requirements, right? Th that's all in the proposed rule. They're best practices that we recommend people put in place now ahead of the rules finalization. Um, but again, the rule's been pending for a couple of years now, and um, it's unclear when those, when those requirements are gonna take force. All right, well, thank you. And thank, thanks to our panelists, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>